uh, we immediately move on um, to Ray Gibbs' talk. So it seems a bit redundant to try to introduce him now um, after Robin has already featured uh, his contribution to the field so well. Um, but for the ref records, I'll give an introduction anyway. So Ray Gibbs was distinguished professor of psychology at University of California, Santa Cruz until he, he retired in 2018. He has been working on metaphor, irony, and other figurative uses since the um, 80s from a cognitive science perspective. He has published widely on these topics, including numerous books that are relevant for the subject matter. So Robin has just mentioned his um, uh, a couple of his contributions. Uh, there's a 2012 book with Herb Colston, Interpreting Figurative Meaning. Um, there's the Cambridge Handbook of Metaphor and Thought that Ray edited. Uh, and he has also been editor of Metaphor and Symbol. So it's obvious that he had a big impact uh, on the study of metaphors, um, even way before you know, experimental pragmatics existed. Uh, but a key link um, is what Robin uh, already told us that the cost and benefits of metaphor actually starts out with looking at race research and also ut utilizing his paradigm of referential metonymy. Uh, so I'm very curious um, what Ray will present to us today with all his experience on metaphor. So thanks for being here, Ray, and take it away. Great, thank you. Can you, can you see my slides there? Yeah, perfect. Great. Well, good morning. I don't usually give talks at 6.30 in the morning, but the sun is slowly coming up, and so I'm ready to do some experimental pragmatics. I'm gonna be talking to you about pragmatic complexities in metaphorical expression and interpretation. And I wanna start off with a story about seven years ago, I still, when I was a professor, I had a new graduate student who was interested in the relationship between language and thought. And so he was off reading all these different things in these different fields. And one day he came to me, he says, Ray, I've discovered there's actually this formal subdiscipline called experimental pragmatics. I went, oh, yes, yes, great. You should go read these things. And I pointed him off to, to go read some various things. And he came back about six weeks later, and we were having to talk about this. And he had a question for me. And the question was, is Ira Novak the guiding light of experimental pragmatics? Now, when I heard this, I laughed immediately because it's actually true. Ira is kind of the guiding light of experimental pragmatics. He's done all of this very important scientific work and several topics within the, within the field. He's also been a guiding light in terms of his leadership and trying to promote the, the creation and, and the discipline of subdiscipline of experimental pragmatics. So he's really been extremely important. But at the same time, when I understanding this particular question, it wasn't just simply a matter of me trying to understand the metaphor of Ira as a guiding light there was much more pragmatically going on here. So that, interestingly enough, my student didn't make a rhetorical question. He didn't say, isn't Ira Novak the guiding light of experimental pragmatics? He made it seem like it was a more serious question for which he was interested in my opinion. And knowing his particular discourse style, I had a sense that he probably thought from his readings that Ira might be the guiding light but he wanted to test me out by asking a, a polite, serious question first. And so I want to talk today a little bit about how, when we talk about and do research on how people understand metaphor, there's often a lot of pragmatic complexity that surrounds that, that influences our results. And so we need to think about that pragmatic complexity. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about pragmatic complexity, and I'm going to describe several things where, indeed, again, when we understand metaphor, what we're understanding is more than just the metaphorical meaning per se. I'm going to talk a little bit about metaphorical meaning without metaphorical language, which I think is something we need to kind of grasp. I'm going to talk a little bit about the topic of metaphor resistance, and at the end, I'm going to say a few words about cascades of metaphorical thought. And each one of these, again, is looking at some of the more pragmatic complexities of metaphor and why we need to think more seriously about it. So uh, Robin just did an absolutely 
magnificently beautiful job describing this experiment that Novak uh, Iron and his colleagues did a bunch of years ago. And she described the results again that the, these particular uh, studies showed that people took longer to understand the metaphorical expressions than the uh, literal, so called literal ones. And as she said, it kind of was consistent with some of the things I had found earlier. And again, I, as I talked about, and as she mentioned, I always said that there's something special going on here because these were referential descriptions, not predictive. And more generally, Ira and his colleagues wanted to sort of uh, push forward the idea that with metaphor, the additional cognitive effects that we get will typically require additional kinds of cognitive effort. And this again goes to the longstanding debate in uh, the world of metaphor and cognitive science about whether or not metaphor is more difficult to process than literal language. And I think one of the things that Ira talked about and his colleagues in this study that they did is that they suggested a lot of the previous studies that showed that metaphors can be understood quite quickly were done when their contexts were biased very strongly to the metaphorical meaning, whereas the context that they used were more neutral. And so we can have a discussion about the the importance of trying to use neutral versus biased context. I'm not quite sure what a neutral context really is, but I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. But I, I, I wanna to suggest to you that the idea that there's more cognitive metaphor requires more effort because of its effort is not universally correct. And I wanna do this first by just describing one set of studies that I did in 1992 in a paper called, What Do Idioms Really Mean? This is in the Journal of Memory and Language. And I was interested in uh, these expressions like blow your stack, flip your lid, hit the ceiling. And we typically think of these as dead metaphors, but within the cognitive linguistics community that I circulate in, these kinds of expressions are thought to be motivated by these underlying embodied metaphors, such as anger is heated fluid in the bodily container. And when you do this mapping of the source domain of heated fluid onto anger, you get a variety of kinds of inferences or entailments. And I wanted to see if those were actually part of our understanding of these different idioms. And I did it in the following way. First, I wanted to get people's intuitions about their experiences of the source domain, which in this case, the example that I'm looking at here is heated fluid in the bodily container. So I said to people, imagine the embodied experience of sealed containers with fluid. And I asked them three questions. What would cause the container to explode? Does the container explode accidentally or purposely? And does the explosion occur in a gentle or violent manner? And people had very strong intuitions, very consistent intuitions that the cause of the container exploding was internal pressure. When the container exploded, it did so accidentally. And when it exploded, it happened in a violent manner. And once the fluid got out of the container, it was very difficult to get it back into the container. So I then wanted to see again, if these kinds of inferences were part of people's understanding of different kinds of idioms. And so here's a, a subject uh, experiment that I did following this is where I had people read stories about say, for example, a woman who was preparing for a big dinner party and she had to do all this work and her husband was trying, was supposed to help her but he didn't show up to just when the party began. And so when he walked in the door, she either uh, blew her stack or she got very angry. And people read this line, either the idiom of the so-called literal equivalent, which isn't a, a really an equivalent, as I'll show. And I measured how long it took people to do those. But then I asked people to rate after each context, their agreement with three statements. Sally got very angry because she was under pressure. Sally got very angry without intending to do so. Sally got very angry in a forceful manner. And again, these are things that I learned from the previous study about people's experiences of the source domain. And when they rated these on a seven point scale in terms of their agreement, the rating showed that people gave much significantly higher ratings having read the idiom than the literal paraphrase. And so it seems then that people are kind of getting these kinds of inferences when they're reading these idioms, despite the fact that the processing time is very quick compared to the literal. In follow-up studies, I even manipulated the context so that they violated one of these different entailments or meanings. And when I did that, actually the reading time for the idioms increased significantly. 
So there really is an important match between what is conceptually and pragmatically going on in the context and the speed or ease with which you understand these kinds of, in this case, idiomatic expressions. But my argument here is that these kinds of expressions, blow your stack, um, uh, hit the ceiling, get pissed off, they don't just simply mean to get very angry. They're not dead metaphors. They maintain their conceptual metaphorical roots. And what they really and pragmatically imply is something much more complex, that the getting angry is when the cause was some internal force or pressure, when the angry behavior was expressed unintentionally, and when the anger behavior was expressed in a forceful manner. The paraphrase to get very angry does not convey this kind of specificity at all. It's much vaguer. So what we see here, at least here in the case with these conventional metaphorical expressions, you can get many kinds of cognitive effects, additional specific meanings with very little kind of cognitive effort. And so I think that these are some of the things that uh, are important to look at in terms of what the relationship is between cognitive effort and cognitive effects. But I also wanna extend this a little bit and talk more about how some of the things in the pragmatics of the context have an influence on, on the speed with which people interpret metaphors. So here's a case I was looking at. Um, uh, lawyers are also sharks stated at a context what, at the end of one of three different kinds of contexts. One, when that metaphorical expression strengthens an existing belief, that something said it already in the context about uh, lawyers, and this has strengthened that idea. And, and there's different contexts in with the idea of the metaphor added new information about lawyers. And in a third case, when the context suggested that this metaphor contradicted an existing belief. And not surprisingly, perhaps, people take different amounts of times to read this metaphor in these different contexts. So they're fastest and strengthens an existing belief, they're slower significantly if it adds new information, and they're even slower beyond that in terms of contradicting an existing belief. So when we're looking at how people understand metaphor, it isn't just the metaphor, it's what the metaphor is pragmatically doing in some context that we are also measuring. A different kind of uh, study along this vein is uh, something I did 2010 looking at people's understanding of the resemblance metaphor, my marriage is an icebox. And this has appeared <clears throat> at the end of one of two kinds of contexts, one in which a person was just simply describing their marriage and at the end said, my marriage is an icebox. And in a second context, two people were having a conversation and one person said, are you happy in your marriage? And a person replies, my marriage is an icebox which is demands kind of a conversational implicature to infer I'm not happy in my marriage. Now you would think that because it requires a conversational implicature of some sort in the second case, that it would take people longer to understand it in the second context compared to the first. But in fact, it's the opposite. People are much faster to understand my marriage is an icebox when it offers reply to a question, are you happy in your marriage? So the, the discourse structure sets up a thing so that when you see the metaphor, as soon as you compute enough meanings of that metaphor to be able to answer the question, that is sufficiently optimally relevant so you can push the button and say, I understand what the person is trying to communicate. In the first context where they're just describing their marriage, people might in the experiment when they're reading it, and for a variety of different ways in which marriages can be like icebox and therefore it takes people longer. And I have actually in addition looked at people's written interpretations of these metaphors in these different contexts and people write out more meanings for the metaphor in the first case than they do in the second because I don't think they're generating as many kinds of rich metaphorical meanings in the case where they're replying to a specific question. So these results suggest that metaphorical meanings, apart, pragmatic meaning apart from metaphor, are the things that are partly influencing comprehension speed when we're looking at reading time, for example, for metaphorical language. And for this reason, pragmatics affects what is seen as optimally relevant interpretations of metaphorical statements. It isn't just the metaphorical meaning alone, it's what the metaphor is doing in the context that we always need to appreciate it and, and take into account when we do these kinds of experiments and interpret their results. Now in the book, Interpreting Figurative Meaning with 
uh, Herb Colston, we did a huge review of a lot of the literature and figures of language processing. And in terms of these questions about whether figurative language or metaphorical language requires more or less time than so-called equivalent, our conclusion was there is no general answer to that question. And so that experimental studies can look at some of the specificities, but there's no one general answer that we'll ever find in this because the results in experiments depend upon who the people are, whether the language materials, not only in terms of the metaphors, whether they're referential, uh, our predication, what's going on in the contexts, the very particularities of the experimental tasks are going to have an influence on what kind of data you get, the ways in which you analyze the data are going to have an effect upon the data you get. And not only do these things individually have a force, but they interact with each other in very complex ways. So it's really difficult to predict more generally as to whether or not there is this simple relationship that more effort gives you more effects or more effects requires more effort. So here's another kind of pragmatic um, complexity that I've been interested. This comes from a book that I edited a bunch of years ago on mixed metaphors. And the fact of the matter is metaphors are often mixed. And here's one example of this. The column produced more flames than an oil field in Abu Dhabi. The historical tone of the column is astounding, wrote cyber pundit Brock Meeks. This sort of journalistic tripe is poison, yet at the same time grist for the mill among the twisted jackals who make up Congress and who it seems have no qualms about using the internet as a personal whipping post whenever it suits their fancy. So we have a, a variety of different kinds of expressions in here that are kind of mixed up. And the question is whether or not these add difficulty to your processing of what is being said here. And my suggestion is that that's not necessarily the case. Um, here's another example to consider. I don't want to say they lost sight of the big picture, but they have marched to a different drummer, Victor Fortuno, the general counsel of legal service corporation said of the individual lawyer's challenge, whether it will upset the apple cart, I don't know. Now there's a lot of work in cognitive linguistics and other places that suggest that, you know, these mixed metaphors are not unusual. We see them in written discourse. We see them a great deal in conversational exchanges. Mixed metaphors to some degree may be more the norm than saying that they're not mixed. And so it, it, it's something that demands our attention. And there's a whole bunch of ways that metaphors can be mixed. We can have multiple source domains for a single target domain. We can have multiple target domains that are partially understood through a so single source domain and many other kinds of variations. And there hasn't been a huge amount of exper experimental work on this, but to some of the stuff that I've done and published says that mixed metaphors are not necessarily particularly difficult to interpret, despite they offer these complex pragmatic meanings in the sense you're bouncing around between these different metaphors and each one has a slightly different meaning. And part of the reason why I don't think mixed metaphors are necessarily difficult is because they often reflect our multiple metaphorical ways of thinking about particular topics. So if I think about my marriage, I can think about it in multiple metaphorical ways. Those metaphors may indeed sometimes be contradictory with one another, but each one of them illuminates some sense of my impression of what my marriage is about. And this ability to think of things in mixed multiple metaphorical ways is I think just part of our cognitive flexibility and it is why I think mixed metaphors are so common. They're not errors, they're not showing that we have sloppy thinking, but in fact they reflect the fact that we do think in massively multiple metaphorical ways about a lot of things. And I have written about something called the mixed metaphor test, which is simply a challenge. If you have a theory of metaphor, we want to hear, it would be nice to hear, how you can handle the existence and the understanding of various kinds of mixed metaphors. So this is something which I think is part of the complexity of metaphor, which is something I think is very much worth looking at. Multimodal metaphor. Metaphors don't just simply appear on uh, experimental screens. Uh, there's a lot of uh, in interactions as uh, Robin mentioned some of these things. We get gestures, bodily postures, facial expressions. And so gestures is one, and this is an example of a, what I consider to be an experimental pragmatic study. 
And this is looking at people's ERPs when they're understanding statements like those salesmen are parrots, where they're also presented with a, a visually a gesture and the gesture could be consistent, like someone moving their hand as if they're parrot talking or some kind of inconsistent gesture, which doesn't make sense given the particular context. And not surprisingly, perhaps when you have greater incongruity between the gesture and the utterance, you have a greater metaphorical uh, ampli uh, higher waves for N400 400 as well as for late positive complex waves. But more interestingly, a lot of research, including this one, have shown that gesture and speech are combined very early on during online language, including in this case, online metaphor understanding. So it's not the case that you kind of look at the utterance and make sense of that, and then the gesture comes in after that to kind of modulate in that some way. Your gestural information, such as seeing some metaphorical reference to the thing that's being discussed may have has an, as an aid in terms of your understanding the metaphor and indeed may carry a certain kind of pragmatic weight. And so this is a kind of complexity that I think people are looking at and is something that we need to take into mind when we look at what metaphor is really about, for example, particularly in face-to-face -face conversation. Now, this is a topic that I've been becoming more interested in uh, in various ways over the years because it isn't the case that you need metaphorical language to convey metaphorical meaning. In many cases, literal language can, can in some contexts, convey metaphorical meanings. And I wanna give you some examples of this. The first one, again, is a gesture kind of stuff. This is work by Alan Chanky, who was studying people's uh, concepts of cheating in university students, both in Russia and in the United States. And he, had these interviews with various people and he recorded the interviews. And there was a very common kind of thing that people did when they were talking about their behaviors. So when they talked about trying to be honest, a student would say, I always try to be honest. And when they did so, they would have these pointing gestures straight ahead. And so this reflects the conceptual metaphor of honesty as being straight. And that's why things that are dishonest are crooked. So here the language itself linguistically is perfectly literal, but the gesture is metaphorical. And so the overall communicative event, what's understood is partly shaped by the gesture. And in fact, comes one may come away with a metaphorical reading of something which is typically seen as nothing more than a literal expression. So how that works and the actual impact upon what one infers metaphorically by just seeing a metaphorical gesture is something what we, this hasn't been a, enough empirical work on as at this moment, but it's definitely an area worth of study. Now, my own interest in the idea that certain kinds of literal language can actually convey metaphor began a long time ago where I was doing these studies on certain idioms such as go out on a limb, skating on thin ice, rock the boat, and what we discovered is that when you put these in very strict literal context, like talking about someone climbing up a tree and going out on a limb, that you get immediately activation or evocation of metaphorical ideas. So that when one climbs up a tree and physically goes out on a limb, one is metaphorically placing yourself in danger. Similarly, when one is literally physically skating on thin ice, one is metaphorically immediately placing yourself in a precarious situation. When one is literally physically rocking the boat, one isn't actually you know, pacing, uh, upsetting the situation at hand. And so we have this immediate metaphoricity coming in. And I wanna suggest that it's not just simply because of the fact that these expressions are conventionally used metaphorically, but because the literal experiences themselves immediately give rise to the interpretations because the, phys the physical experiences are indications of the larger metaphor. They're representative of the larger metaphors. And that's why we have these particular expressions and why they have the meanings they do, but even in literal context, they convey metaphoricity. This is similarly the case for a lot of proverbs. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched or the early bird catches the worm. So when the bird gets up early and gets out and gets the worm before all the other birds have gotten up and try to go get a worm, 
the early bird has actually done something proverbially, got ahead of the crowd to achieve a particular kind of goal. So when these expressions have very literal meanings in various literal contexts, their metaphoricity comes up because they're representative instances of the metaphorical idea. So the physical literal here I want to suggest is isomorphic with the metaphorical. And I think is the literal and the metaphorical have a great deal of contiguity in everyday experience. And for this reason, I don't, for example, think that when you are taking a journey in life, that that's a completely literal experience. And then maybe on some occasions, you may use that to refer to life, life is a journey, and create this cross-domain mapping. But rather, there's a contiguity between the literal and the metaphorical such that there is no need for across the main mapping for talking about various kinds of metaphors. And indeed, certain kinds of literal expressions may communicate metaphor. Consider this compare. Sally was making good progress driving across Canada, which is a typically a completely literal expression talking about a physical journey. Sally was making good progress in planning her upcoming wedding, which we'll think is a conventional metaphorical expression. And I want to suggest that even in the literal case here of driving across Canada, there's some metaphorical inferences that arise from this. And the reason is both of these kinds of expression refer to completing some kind of plan as reaching the end of a journey. where We have the beginning of the journey that we overcome obstacles, perhaps along the way. At certain points, we'll assess our progress. And then at the end, hopefully we'll reach our goal. And you see this too, again, as I said, for the literal expression where Sally has to begin her journey, she overcomes obstacles along the way, she assesses her progress, and she reaches the goal. It isn't strictly just a physical journey. It always has more metaphorical, symbolic meanings to it. And so a lot of the literal expressions may have these higher order metaphorical meanings as part of what they communicate. Most generally, concrete experiences are never just purely physical. And I happen to be very slowly writing a book called The Metaphorical Body. And you know, we think of the body as this physiological, biological entity, which we will sometimes use as a source domain in many kinds of metaphors. But the body itself is understood metaphorically most of the time. So concrete, literal, physical experiences are often infused with rich, pragmatic, symbolic metaphorical meanings. And these pragmatic metaphorical meanings are contiguous with the physical experiences. We don't just have the physical experiences alone. The physical experiences gives immediate rise to the metaphoricity because they're representative of some aspect of the larger metaphorical idea. And for this reason, I've been suggesting some of the people in cognitive linguistics that it might be the case then when we think of journeys as lives and the connection between them, they may not necessarily be across the main mapping. It may be much more a matter of contiguity. And so metaphor itself may not always be due to across the main mapping the way that people in cognitive linguistics suggest. There may be much more of a, based on contiguity. And this is something which I have in press. And then um, another kind of literal language that will convey metaphoricity is allegory. An allegory is typically thought to be kind of an artistic or literary device that conveys hidden or complex meanings through symbolic figures, actions, imagery, or events, which together express some higher order moral, spiritual, or political message. And certainly they are these things, and there's many wonderful works of literature and art that express or convey allegories. But I want to suggest that allegory is a more general cognitive principle, which I'll call the allegorical impulse. An allegory is a fundamental property of human cognition in which we continually seek diverse connections between the immediate here and now with more abstract, enduring symbolic themes. And in a way, I was just referring to this when we talk about journeys. We have these, we immediately infer these higher order kinds of things as part of it. They're part of the, this, the the here and now. And so we wanted to look at this in uh, various contexts, and I've done various studies of this, but let me give you an example of the allegorical impulse in action in, the ter in terms of poetry. 
And this is a study that I, uh, I've done with Lacey Okonski, who was published last year in the Journal of Pragmatics on a poem called Diving Into the Wreck, written by Adrian Rich. It's actually a very famous poem. It's, it's a wonderful example of a feminist poem. And many people have written about it, what it means, what its allegories may be. And so let me give you an example of just the first opening stanzas to it and then tell you what we did. So the poem begins, first having read the book of myths and I actually can't read what I've got here and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade. I put on the body, body armor, black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask. I'm having to do this knock like Cousteau with his assiduous team aboard the sun flooded schooner, but here alone. There is a ladder. The ladder is always there hanging innocently close to the side of the schooner. We know what it is for, we who have used it. Otherwise, it is a piece of maritime floss, some sundry equipment. I go down, rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me, the blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down, my flippers cripple me. I crawl like an insect down the ladder and there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. And so the poem proceeds for many stanzas and it has the person going down into the ocean in the scuba diving gear, going to the bottom and examining the wreckage of a ship, an old ship that has been wrecked and is sitting there. And the, the scuba diver examines it and makes various comments about it. And the question is, what is this poem all about? And so what we did is a study where we had people read the poem under three different kinds of instructional conditions. And then they had to write out what they thought the poem was about. In the first case, we gave them no instructions. They just read the poem and wrote their interpretations. In a second condition, we tried to push them towards the physical or perhaps even the literal meaning of the poem to say by reading this as a story about scuba diving. And then in the third condition, we wanted to just kind of alert them to the possibility there might be an allegorical interpretation to this poem by saying to read this as a story about a failed relationship where the person goes down and looks at the wreckage of their marriage as if it's the wreckage of a failed relationship. And the, the main point of these studies is to show that in fact, when people are pushed to read this in its most literal way as simply a story about scuba diving, they give very rich metaphorical and dare I say, allegorical interpretations. And here's an example. And for this particular condition, I believe that the poem is about someone who has done or experienced something awful in his life and is either literally returning to where it happened or continues to play the event in his mind. He sounds really sullen and even regretful and describes his surroundings with a lot of dark imagery. I think that the actual act of diving down to the wreck is him in a way facing the darkness in his life or reliving it and seems like there is something he does regularly or at least enough to be a veteran at it. So here again, even though we kind of push them towards reading it in a sort of literal physical way, they inferred allegorical kinds of messages. In a follow-up study, we tried to push them even further to reading it in a more physical way by giving them a long description about how to scuba dive from like a scuba diving magazine. So it really emphasizes all the mechanics of scuba diving and what happens when you dive. And we gave that to them in one condition before they read the poem. But once again, even in that case, they give allegorical interpretations. So even when prompted by extended physical descriptions about how to scuba dive, people still automatically infer these allegorical meanings. And so people seem to be unable to resist inferring allegory when they're reading language that in some cases is very non-metaphorical. And in this paper, as in many aspects of the work I've done recently, I emphasize that these are perhaps understood via embodied simulation processes where people imagine themselves engaging in the actions depicted in the poem and it's from that embodied simulation that they come to understand the broader symbolic, metaphorical, allegorical uh, significance of what the poem may be referring to. And even though this is a poetry experiment, I want to suggest that these allegorical interpretations is not simply because they're reading your poem and people know that when you read poems, you're supposed to find hidden meanings because we find this ability to 
come up with allegorical messages in a lot of non-literary places as well. So this may be, the, the, the fact that it's a poem may lead them to this, but I don't think you can explain the fact that people are so unable to resist allegorical interpretations simply because they're reading poetry. So another topic is uh, on a paper that I and Josie Simmons have done that's coming out in language and cognition on metaphor resistance. And I think this is another kind of pragmatic complexity that should play a role in our thinking about metaphor. So we often resist metaphors in various ways in different contexts. In kind of in a historical way, we have metaphors that we fight over. So in American psychology for 50 years in the 20th century, we, the behaviorists used to argue that the mind are black boxes. The mind is a black box. But in the 1950s and 60s, when cognitive science came into being through the rise of computing uh, technology, people started thinking of an alternative, minds or computers, and they actively resisted the minds or black boxes metaphor. And there was debate for a good 25 years over this. And I can remember as late as 1980, I think, the great American psychologist B.F. Skinner wrote a paper why he's not a cognitive psychologist precisely because of why he resisted the minds or computers metaphors. So a lot of scholarly debates in scientific disciplines, especially revolve around you know, people proposing a metaphor and other people resisting it and proposing an alternative. And so resistance to metaphor plays a part in scientific and academic debates and discoveries. But we personally often come up with meta counter metaphors that are imposed upon us that we will resist. So a lot of people who are ill or suffering, for example, of cancer will resist it when medicine and physicians, for example, say that we need to treat your cancer as if it's a war because patients wanna go, well, I don't want my body to be the battleground between say the cancer and chemo or between cancer and radiation. I wanna think of my situation here as treating cancer as a kind of journey that goes through various kinds of stages. So we often resist metaphors that are placed upon us and we struggle to come up with ones that we find more appropriate for what we are interested in and what challenges that we face. And here's a metaphor that you could resist. All toads to the side of the pool. Now imagine you're in an experiment somewhere and someone presents you this on a screen and you recognize the reference here that the toads or the tadpoles refers to children, but you immediately kind of subconsciously go, wait a minute, children's aren't toads or tadpoles, they're angels, I love children. And so you're thinking all of this and you know what you're doing? You're sitting there and you haven't pushed the button yet because you're too busy resisting. And then when you push the button, you may give a, evidence of a long latency that reflects not just simply you're trying to come up with a metaphorical meaning, but you're resisting the metaphor in some way. And so that resistance is part of what we're often measuring in our experiments. And I'm not picking an iron as colleagues here. I think this is true of lots of things that we all do when we do experiments on metaphor. There's aspects of resistance there. So resistance I wanna suggest here is an ordinary part of the pragmatics of metaphor understanding. It affects the range of metaphorical meanings inferred and the degrees to we, which we see these as being credible. And although there's various evidence of resistance in other areas of psychology, uh, it hasn't been implied very much at all, as far as I can tell the psycholinguistics, but it's really something that's a, an area that's ripe for possible experimental study in the pragmatics of metaphor use. And the final thing I wanna to mention today simply is cascades of metaphor. And this is another aspect of pragmatic complexity that I think is interesting. This is from a paper that Karina Rasse and I published in the Journal of Literary Semantics last year. And, um, <clears throat> The paper is actually looking at metaphorical thinking in J.D. Salinger's famous novel, The Catcher in the Rye. And this is a novel about a young man named Holden Caulfield, who is a 17 year old kid, who at the beginning of the novel is just about to be thrown out of his third private school, high school in the United States. And he's a very troubled kid. He's smart, but he's terrible as a student. He gets into trouble. And it's a very funny book. He's very acerbic, he's sarcastic. And, and at the same time, it really shows the tremendous degree of teenage angst he experiences. 
And so we looked at the ways that metaphor comes into this book in, in a lot of complex ways. And so I want to give you one example of these kind of cascades of metaphor. So early on in the book, he had to go see the headmaster of the school he was at, and he's thrown out by the headmaster. And then he later goes and talks to a teacher of his who asks him what happened when he went to see the headmaster. And so the teacher says to him, what did Dr. Thurmer, the headmaster, say to you, boy? I understand you had quite a little chat. And then Holden replies, yes, we did. We really did. I was in the office for about two hours, I guess. Well, what did he say to you? Oh, well, about life being a game and all, and how you should play it according to the rules. He was pretty nice about it. I mean, he didn't hit the ceiling or anything. He just kept talking about life being a game and all, you know? Life is a game, boy. Life is a game that one plays according to the rules. Yes, sir, I know it is. I know it. But then Holden kind of confesses to the reader, game my ass, some game. If you get on the side where all the hot shots are, then it's a game, all right. I'll admit that. But if you get in the other side where there aren't any hot shots, then what's the, what's the game about it? Nothing, no game. So this is a beautiful instance of resistance of metaphor. And the entire book has these various segments where he introduces aspects about life as a game and he critically comments on it or he's dismissive of it. So for example, he has various kinds of expressions in the book, throughout the book, where he mentions this life is game idea. So he says, those two people are over there toying with some idea, or these people aren't really doing much at all. They're just shooting the crap. Or this individual, like a child in a game, hasn't had all his marbles anymore, doesn't have all his cognition with them. And he was criticizing this one friend of his who was trying to get a girl to kiss him, and he'll... Holden said he'll never get the first base with her, which is a baseball is a sex analogy. And in each case, he's referring to some aspect of playing the game. And the reason why he's dismissive of this idea is as he was earlier in the book, because he just doesn't think life is a game is an adequate metaphor for describing what goes on in his experience. And partly it's because, and this is a major theme of the book, he thinks people are phonies. And he says this a lot in the book, peoples are phonies. And it really upsets him because he wants more authenticity in life. He wants adults to be more genuine and take care of him and other children like him. And they just simply don't. So you see this theme being picked up throughout the novel in various ways and various kinds of metaphorical patterns cascade through the novel like this. So disparate parts of the novel are linked or coupled via specific metaphorical kinds of themes. And for this re reason, metaphorical thinking and language use isn't just a faucet. It isn't like we come up with a hunk of metaphorical language and we turn the faucet on. When we get to the end of the expression, we turn off the faucet and then start at a neutral place. Rather, metaphoric lurk, metaphorical thinking lurks and unfolds over time in these various complex overlapping waves so that we should think about metaphorical meaning and metaphorical thinking as cascades. And once again, we suggest here that embodied simulations give rise to these rich meanings and aesthetics effects because you're imagining yourself engaging in these various kinds of actions of playing games and so forth, which is why they have the power that they do over us. Now, there hasn't been any specific empirical work looking at this eye per se. And you know this is one of the challenges of doing experimental pragmatic work on longer hunks of discourse. There is his own field of the scientific study of literature. And there's a lot of kind of surveys you can do asking people about their feelings, given the fact that they've read something. But it's an area which is gonna take a lot of thinking to come up with good experiments particularly given the length of novels, but it's, it's interesting. I'd like to see we can do more on how these metaphorical thinking processes unfold as layers in the course of reading longer stretches of, of text or even in conversation. These are my conclusions. Metaphor is full of different kinds of pragmatic complexity. These include a variety of ranges of metaphorical meanings, and importantly, 
it isn't just metaphor alone we're looking at. We're looking at the pragmatic aims that people have in using metaphor. And both of these together interact to shape both what metaphors are produced as well as how they are interpreted, how much time we give to them, what kinds of effects we uh, infer from them. And this includes other kinds of complexities such as multimodal metaphor. I didn't talk today about various kinds of bodily actions that are metaphorical. So you just, you, you engage in an action and convey a metaphor just through your bodily actions alone. There's a bunch of those things where metaphorical meaning is communicated. There's mixed metaphors, which is part of the complexity. There's a variety of aspects of metaphorical meaning without metaphorical language. I think metaphor resistance is something that is very much uh, worthy of, uh, of further consideration in theories of metaphor. And then again, finally, there are these cascades of metaphoricity and discourse. And I, I have no idea what the future holds. And I'm not saying everybody should run out and study these things, I, who knows? But I, I just do privately believe that pragmatic theories and experimental pragmatic studies would be do well to pay attention to these kinds of complexities, because I think in some sense, some of these are already active and underlying some of the work that we've already done, including myself. And all of this goes to my general push to expand how we think of pragmatics, which is not just simply a matter of a certain kinds of knowledge that comes into play at certain temporal moments in our understanding of language, but the pragmatics is everything that people, their situation, their motivations, the experimental tasks, all of these are part of the pragmatics that shape our experiences of, in this case, of metaphor. Ira, I wanna thank you, dude, for doing all the things you've done. It's, a, it's fabulous to have you here with us today and hearing all of your comments. Thank you for everything you've done for experimental pragmatics. Valentina Filippo, thank you for all the work and others have done here to make this event happen. And as I uh, was calculating the other day, I've been doing experimental pragmatics for 40, almost 47 years. And for whatever reason, I like it. It's something I love doing. I'm very happy to be part of this community and being uh, friends with all of you. So happy anniversary to Experimental Pragmatics. Thank you very much.